Good evening. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library and Museum. It is so nice to see real faces in front of me and not a computer screen. I am so glad that you all are here tonight. <laughs> On behalf of our partners, Acapella Books and the Atlanta chapter of the North Carolina Central University Alumni Association, I want to welcome you to what I think is a very special program tonight. We're honored tonight to be able to spend the evening with Ambassador Andrew Young, marking his 90th birthday this past Saturday. We're part of that celebration. And we're going to hear a lot about his remarkable life in the next hour from reporter and author Ernie Suggs and graphic designer Don Bermudez. Ernie, as you all probably know, covers race and culture for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He's a graduate of North Carolina Central University, and we thank the Alumni Support, uh, Association for their support. He was selected as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University and now serves on the fellowship board. Don Bermudez is a multi-talented graphic artist and designer. He got his formal training at Columbus College of Art and Design in Columbus, Ohio. And those of you who are, have already gotten a copy of the book, The uh, Many Lives of Andrew Young, will see Don's amazing work in the, uh, the pictures and layout in there. I had the pleasure of working with Don uh, when he created an exhibit at the uh, King's, King Center. Uh, it was an exhibit about uh, President Carter and Martin Luther King, both of Atlanta's uh, Nobel Peace Prize uh, Award winners. And then most importantly, Ambassador Andrew Young. There has been a lot said about Ambassador Young over the past week, and you will hear a lot more tonight. I just want to relay one personal story um, that I think typifies Andrew Young to me. We hosted reporter Katherine Johnson a few years ago to talk about her relationship with Coretta Scott King, and she was in conversation with Andrew Young. And during that program, I found out that former First Lady Barbara Bush had passed away uh, while, while the program was underway. And so we got to the end of the program and I thanked Catherine, and I thanked Ambassador Young, and then I mentioned that Barbara Bush had passed away. And Ambassador Young, without pausing or leaving the stage, offered a beautiful prayer of remembrance for Mrs. Bush, because that's the type of person he is. So please join me in welcoming Ernie Suggs, Dong Bermudez, and Ambassador Andrew Young. And I think at this point it might be fitting since his birthday was on Saturday if you will join me in happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday Ambassador Young, happy birthday to you. Ernie, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, Tony. And uh, this, is, um, this is crazy because I've been out in the audience many times for these events. I've sat on this stage many times uh, as a moderator, but I never in my wildest dreams thought I'd be here talking about a book that I've written. Uh, so I appreciate you all coming out here. And when Tony told me that, um, when Tony called me and said he wanted to do this, I was excited. And you know, then he called me and said it was sold out and I was more excited. Then he called me and said that, um, that uh, Book TV is going to be broadcasting it. So Book TV, the cameras are there. They're going to be broadcasting this. Then he told me that he opened up more seats, and that sold out. So I was like, wow, this is crazy, because you know, I've never 
been this popular before in my life. And I, was <laughs> and I was telling Tony this, and I was like, you know, I finally made it, I finally hit big time, and you know, I'm, a, I'm gonna become a big, you know, New York Times bestseller. And Tony, you know, for those of you who all know Tony, he wasn't saying anything. And I'm just talking and talking and going on for five minutes. And I look over at him, and finally he says, you know that Andy Young is gonna be here too, right? <laughs> so, so, so I know that you all are here to talk to and to see the great uh, Ambassador Andrew Young. So I want to introduce my brother, and uh, you, you guys give him a round of applause, Brother Andrew Young. <laughs> and, and let me introduce my homeboy from New Orleans who, uh, who went through piles and piles of uh, memorabilia and uh, who knew that my mother required me to write every week when I went away to college. And her thing was, if I don't get a letter, I'll assume that uh, everything's all right and you don't need any money. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a letter almost every week I was away in college. Uh, and uh, he dug through that uh, the Amistad exhibit at Tulane University in New Orleans where my mother took all of her papers. Uh, and uh, then the Auburn Avenue Library here on Auburn Avenue in Cortland where there's something like 5,000 books? 540 boxes. boxes. 540 boxes. We only went through 40. Okay. <laughs> but he did the grunt work of uh, pulling together the pieces of my life. And since I didn't have anything to do but to live it, um, I am really grateful because, uh, damn, I'm somebody. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Well, I, I want to I I start off, I want to read something. Uh, this is um, you know, I write for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And on Sunday, hope you all subscribe today, JC. On Sunday, I wrote an essay about the relationship that I have with um, Ambassador Young, dating back 26 years when I was a young reporter in Durham. And I say, um, in the name of the book, you know, is The Many Lives of Andrew Young. And I write, over the years, I've carefully watched how people address Andrew Young. The AJC standard practice is to refer to him on first reference as ambassador. James Orange, who many of you know, called him my leader, while C.T. Vivian, called him doctor, but they called everybody that. Andy is preferred by those who know him casually, but sometimes he gets congressman or mayor or reverend, and even in some African kingdoms, they call him king. Uh, there are a group of folks around the ages of his daughter who call him Uncle Andy because he is almost like a father figure. I choose to call him brother, my brother, Andrew Young. So I wanna ask you the first question in the many lives of Andrew Young. When you get up in the morning and you look at yourself in the mirror, who are you? You know, that's what I try to figure out every damn day. <laughs> it, it's, um, and, and basically, well, when I left college, I felt like I had wasted all of my life up to that time. Though I had a diploma, and I ran to the top of Kings Mountain, because that was 1951, everything was segregated. Uh, the only place we could stop was at a missionary school in uh, Kings Mountain. And my mother and father were there at a conference and I went out running up the mountain. And um, when you're running, you, toward a mountain and you're running downhill and you don't realize it, but you're going faster than you're supposed to. And then I decided to run to the top of the mountain and I was already exhausted. And I, I just sort of passed out, I think. I don't know what happened. But when I woke up or opened my eyes and came to, um, the world just looked different. And um, it hit me that everything I saw had a purpose. Uh, the trees, the cows, 
the cornfields, you know, the sky. And there was an awakening that uh, everything I see here has a purpose. And whoever made heaven and earth couldn't have made everything without a, with a purpose except me. And so I came down from that mountain figuring I got to have a purpose. And I don't care what it is. I don't need to know. Uh, it, one day at a time. And I do the best I can today and tomorrow will take care of itself. So I, I tell it this long way because the truth of it is I don't have a clue who I am. <laughs> you know, when I wake up in the morning. It's whatever, you know, it's just like Nobody knew we'd be in the middle of a war right now. This, we thought this was over with after Vietnam. You know, and, and here we are on, on the edge of total destruction, uh, except for a couple of crazy people. Uh, and probably the most unity we've seen in the rest of the world uh, since the close of World War II. Uh, so there's, who was it? Somebody used to say that, uh, I, it's one of these favorite sayings that, of Martin Luther King that uh, the world's in balance mm -hmm. and which way it turns depends on what decision you make that day. Mm -hmm. And I don't think of it that dramatic, but uh, I really do figure that every day has to make a difference some kind of way to somebody. Mm -hmm. See, uh, and uh, it makes for a really interesting life. So when you went up that mountain, and you're almost describing a biblical or spiritual journey, you went up that mountain having graduated from Howard University, having defied your father who wanted you to be a dentist, so to speak, and you came down that mountain a different person. I think so. And, um, but again, I wanted to be an athlete too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I was on the swimming team all winter and the track team all spring. And so physically and mentally, um, and I didn't, I could have flunked out of school, but I, I, I didn't, I mean, I, it was too easy not to. <laughs> uh, but I really only, uh, I mean, I really didn't care what I was learning. I, 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 I cared about not embarrassing my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, but from that point on, it was me and whoever made me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your, your, your fingerprints are all over, not only Atlanta, but all over the world. And we're sitting here. At the, at the Carter Center and at the, the, the Jimmy Carter Presidential Library. And this facility came about when you, you know, when you were mayor. You know, the, 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 um, the it, it's coming about. Tell us a little bit about your relationship, you know, since we're here and President Carter wrote the uh, forward for the book about your relationship with President Carter. Well, um, I think he is one of the truly great men uh, that I've known. He is clearly the most disciplined man I have ever met. Uh, as long as I've known him, uh, whenever I call up uh, and get an appointment, uh, I, I know that I got 15 minutes. <laughs> and I see that as an improvement because when he was in government, you only got five minutes <laughs> because he thinks of his time as sacred. Okay. And as governor, five minutes, he could take a picture, he could hear what you wanted to say, and he could either answer it or assign it to somebody. Mm -hmm. And you were out of there in, 15, in, in five minutes. Uh -huh. um, even in the White House, I could see him anytime, but 
there's something about him that uh, when he gets to your point, uh, he's got other things to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time to go. <laughs> and um, I mean, he 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 really does value time more than anybody I know. Okay. All right. And time is important. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. May's poem, I don't remember it, but it's a tiny little minute, just 60 seconds in it. I can't abuse it, I must use it. Yes. I can't afford to lose it or something <laughs> like that. Oh, the Morehouse guy is always quoting that, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, in 1996, you wrote your autobiography, An Easy Burden. Mm -hmm. um, I can't recall how many years it's been since 1996, but now you're 90 years old, and um, this book comes out. How do you feel about it? I mean, how do you, you've, you've looked at it, of course. Uh, what, do you, what are your thoughts about the book? Well, you all did a, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you all did a, a wonderful job. And um, it really, it really looks like something that it took five or six years to put together. And I think you did it in two months. Yeah. And um, so it's the kind of summary of life, and particularly my life, and my times, that um, well, I've only shouldn't confess that, <laughs> but all of our presidents who write, I've read almost every book President Carter wrote, except <laughs> the one about his presidency. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and um, this is different from that. This is, this is the human life that I have been privileged to be a part of. Uh, and it covers everything but it's the kind of thing that would give people a very good feeling about me and make them think I was really important. <laughs> uh, but I wish I'd had you all working with me on some of my other stuff <laughs> <laughs> and we'd taken time uh, because where the book is weak, I think, is on my time in Atlanta. I mean, um, as mayor, as mayor, mm -hmm. that that there's a lot on the civil rights movement that's very important, and that may be the most important part of my life. Um, the United Nations was extremely important, and I was I was talking to the former prime minister of Jamaica. And I told him, j just this afternoon, he called me to, uh, P.J. Patterson, he called me to wish me a happy birthday. And I said, do you remember when you helped us put together the Panama Canal mm -hmm. Treaty? And he said, yeah. I said, I said, you know, nobody knows anything about that. Well, the hang up on the Panama Canal Treaty was Fidel Castro. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. If Fidel Castro had supported the Canal Treaty, the Senate would have voted against it. <laughs> but if he had attacked the Canal Treaty, the people of Panama would have voted against it. So the whole success of the Panama Canal Treaty was to keep Castro quiet. And President Carter came to me, he said, Andy, You've known a lot of these fellas a good while, haven't you? I said, yeah. He said, you think you can find two or three that can get Castro just to stay out of this? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I, I really do. I think we can. And I came back to him after a little while, after touching base with, with um, Michael Manley of Jamaica, uh, Lopez Portillo of uh, 
Mexico, I think. Um, Oda Bayer of Costa Rica, uh, Carlos Andres Perez of Venezuela. Uh, all of them had been young communists in high school with Castro. Mm -hmm. And they'd all become Democrats and were allies of the United States. And so when I tracked a few of them down, they all said, we can get this done. You Don't worry about this. Let us handle this. Mm -hmm. See? And um, sure enough, it went smoothly. And um, nobody in the State Department ever had a clue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the night after the treaty was signed, we were all staying in the same hotel. And President Carter called me and said, how many of those guys that helped you with Castro are in this hotel? I said, most of them. Mm -hmm. He said, can you gather them in your room around 11 o'clock tonight? And I said, sure. And um, he said, I'd like to thank them personally. Mm -hmm. So I rounded up a half a dozen presidents, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and they were sitting around, and it was really like, uh, one, it was very religious, because they realized that they'd done something together that was sort of unthinkable without Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. Uh, and they might have saved Western Hemisphere. Mm. Uh, but th that's sort of the way uh, things worked with him. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to I wanna, I wanna get with, with Donald about you growing up in New Orleans. But, I, but you mentioned Atlanta. Let's talk about Atlanta first, then we're going to jump to Donald. <clears throat> I, talk, I don't know if Andrea is here, your daughter. But she told me about how when she, you and her ride around the city, how proud you are of what you see and, you know, the buildings and all the construction and what's happening at the airport. You have, you know, obviously made a very major impact well, on this. Well, place. right here. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I figure between the Presidential Parkway and 400, mm -hmm. I got cussed out close to 100 times. <laughs> <laughs> by my friends, uh -huh. you know? And, and they were people who supported me, and, and I didn't lie. Um, I said I wasn't for more roads until I realized there was the possibility of another 150,000 square feet of, of office space and housing that was going to descend on this place mm -hmm. because the airport was already built mm -hmm. uh, and that we would not have been able to function as a city without this presidential parkway. Mm -hmm. And even John Lewis, you know, um, <laughs> voted against it. I mean, all of my friends voted against it. And I got even with John and put his name on it. <laughs> 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 uh, All right. But um, it, it's when I, I was driving in from um, Sandy Springs or way out there somewhere, mm -hmm. and um, the sun was just, it was, oh, it'd been an early morning or something, a uh, Rotary Club or something that meets in the morning, and it was. I mean, the sun was just coming up over the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And uh, I get emotional about stuff like that. Okay. Because I can remember the groundbreakings, see, of the Ritz Carlton. They gave it another name now, but, uh, but uh, and when Lenox Square was uh, a little row of shops. Uh, and when the tallest building in downtown was the uh, Hyatt. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
and the meeting I had with Bill Marriott and John Portman about building the Marriott Marquis. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Bill Marriott ended up building 72 hotels in Atlanta. Oh, wow. While I was mayor. Okay. I mean, that, that was the kind of growth that nobody could believe, see? And so I was operating on things that I knew to be happening. Mm -hmm. And, but even I would not have believed when Kasim Reed was mayor, we averaged $5 billion a year in new investment. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, building permits. Uh, $5 billion a year is the sum total of all of the investment that goes into South Africa, mm -hmm. the whole country. Mm -hmm. The a nation in Europe that has grown like we have grown. Uh, and, um, well, I don't take credit for it, mm -hmm. but I sure am proud of it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you talk a lot about the Atlanta, and I'm going to get to you, Don. We talk a lot about the Atlanta way, and, you know, you, you know, in our many interviews, you talked about in 1946, you came here uh, for a conference at the Butler Street YMCA, and the Klan walked down, marched down Auburn Avenue. Yep. In 1951, you were here with your, I think with your parents, and you were driving down Ponce de Leon, and a rat crosses the street, and you slowed down. He said he slowed down because he felt the rats had more rights than black people in Atlanta. You moved to Atlanta in 1961 um, and worked with Dr. King, and 20 years later, you're the mayor of the city. So is that, and now where we are now, look at what we are now, having hosted the Olympics, having the busiest airport in the world. Is that what the Atlanta way is, that you can... Your well, first impression in 1946 and what you see here now? Yeah, well, no, it wasn't in 46. It didn't, ha the, the Atlanta way didn't happen until, it was about 60, okay. 59, 60. Okay. And it was, well, it was Ivan Allen's, well, maybe go back a little further. I don't know what year that was, but when Hartsfield lost his election, mm -hmm. and he lost the election because he gave Delta a free pass to come to Atlanta and offered them all the land they wanted for a dollar a year for 50 years. Mm -hmm. he, um, he paid $90,000 for all of the basic land that is now the Atlanta airport. And the unforgivable sin was he put up red lights on Peachtree Street. Mm -hmm. And they voted him out of office. <laughs> um, and there was a group of people who did not want to change. Mm -hmm. And there was a group of people that saw change as inevitable. And most of those were related to Coca-Cola because the decision that probably started it all was uh, Mr. Woodruff saying that the soldiers who are defending the United States ought to be able to drink a Coca-Cola anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. They were sent. Well, that was, in addition to being very patriotic, it was probably the best business decision any company ever made. Mm -hmm. uh, and we immediately, on, on that decision, became a world-class city. Mm -hmm. We didn't know it yet. But then J. Paul Austin comes back from uh, South Africa, and he'd been there when they voted in apartheid. Mm -hmm. And he's from, I think, LaGrange, Georgia. And he and Mr. Woodruff and Ivan Allen did not, Ivan Allen was president of the chamber then, they did not want Atlanta to be a backward city. Mm -hmm. And they started talking about something that they call, that ended up being named the plan of improvement. It almost didn't come out until Sam Massell was mayor. And God bless Sam Massell. He's uh, passed on just a day or so ago. 
Sunday. Uh, and um, at 94. But he was in the state legislature, I mean, in, in the city board of aldermen, they called it then, for 30 some years and was mayor, a vice mayor and then mayor. And, um, but all of this had been evolving. And um, they were dreams. Um, Maynard Jackson comes along. Uh, and well, first I got elected to Congress and I wasn't supposed to get elected. The district was still just, I think 38% black. Mm -hmm. And um, I got more black turnout than anybody had ever had before. I think we had a 74% black turnout and we got more white folks voting for me. Mm -hmm. And I beat a very good Republican. Uh, and we became, we were always very good friends. Uh, and uh, Rodney Cook. Uh, and, uh, but things were just changing so fast. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how I started this history, but. Uh, <laughs> no, we're talking about the, um, Atlanta, way. the Atlanta Way. The, yeah. the Atlanta Way, I, I could. I, I attribute to a woman by the name of Helen Bullard, and I don't know who she worked for, but she, t she told all of the business community what to do. Uh, and um, a city too busy to hate was her motto also. Oh, so she came up with Yeah, she, all of this was, and it was, I mean, she worked for Mayor Hartsfield, she worked for Ivan Allen, he, as chamber the president, uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, she worked for Coca-Cola, uh, Dick Goodwin, mm -hmm. and um, but she she had a way, and and she sort of that was one of the reasons why I'm so grateful to Sam Marcel, because when I lost my first race to Congress. Um, he was very worried about racial division. And I think he and Jesse Hill got together and asked, and he appointed me chairman, co-chairman of the Community Relations Commission with Archbishop Donnellan of the Roman Catholic Church. But uh, Helen Bullard was on that commission. Uh, Randy Taylor of the Presbyterian Church. Uh, uh, McKinley Young of the AME Church, and um, I mean it was it was a small group, but it was a powerful representative group, and we must have had six strikes that that uh, summer, mm -hmm. that first summer, but they were all the conflagration of race, and class, and respect, and that's all I'd been doing in the civil rights movement. Yeah. I mean, that's all racism is, a lack of respect that based on race or class. Mm -hmm. And um, so when it happened at Mead Packing Company, um, it was, I mean, there were about six of these during the summer. But we got to the point where we understood the dynamics so well, we could settle them in a matter of days uh, because it, it I think Meade was the one that a black woman didn't take her insulin, forgot to take her insulin, got to work and started feeling dizzy and asked to go home and get her insulin. And her supervisor said, well, if you leave, you miss a day's work. She couldn't miss a day's work, so she passed out. Mm -hmm. Everybody thought, said she died because he wouldn't let her go home and get her medicine. So everybody, will, you know, thousand workers walk out. Mm -hmm. And you got hell on your hands if it's not shut down quickly. Well, I, I had been doing that for a living for Martin Luther King. Okay. Uh, and um, so w we were handling a strike every other week mm -hmm. without, any, without any trouble. Okay. Uh, because we had the respect from the white community, we had the respect from the black community, uh, and we had the respect of poor people. 
because I had been to jail with the garbage workers when I first came back here. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so it, it, and that's why I'm grateful to Sam Mazzell because uh, he took me out of the movement and made me respectable. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's, uh, let's go to um, Donald for a second. And for, for those of you who have a copy of the book, you, you, you see how beautiful it is. And that's all, you know, the beautiful words are mine, but the beautiful <laughs> design is Donald Bermudez. Um, and Donald, you know, yeah. <laughs> Donald, I don't know if Donald's wife is here, but oh. Donald, Donald loves to talk. So, um, you know, I like to watch television. And Don, Don would call me, you know, right in the middle of like the denouement of my favorite TV show and want to talk for two hours. So I would always have to put it on pause. But Donald, thank you for the work you did for the book. And uh, talk a little bit about, because you, you went to New, you're from New Orleans, where um, Ambassador Young is from. You traveled there several times to go through their archives and you found a lot of stuff that he hadn't seen, that uh, Ambassador Young hadn't seen or hadn't seen in a while. So talk about that process and the, and the process of designing the book. Well, um Amanda and Gaurav approached, uh, approached me about the project. We were excited to do it. There have been attempts in previous years to try to put something together. And you know, just never, sometimes we have ideas. And it, but anyway, this, in this case, uh, it was an accelerated timeline. But more importantly, we had an institutional, no we had a knowledge of your life, your story. We've been working with Ambassador Young since 2007, so we kind of knew, okay, this, is, this happened in the chronological order. And then we just had to find the assets, or I had to find the visuals. Now, over the summer, we probably scanned maybe 3,000 images from your home. And that was just digitizing. It wasn't specific to the book. But because we had that catalog, we were able to see some things. And Ambassador Young's mother was a very good uh, organized. She kept every scrap of paper that had to do with him and his brother. <laughs> I mean, they had everything in this, in this archive. She only had four boxes, but they were they had a letter from President Carter that was in this box. And I said, I don't know what else is in there, but I'm going down, I'm driving, I'm going. And I, I went down and met with uh, the archivist, and they had some images of Ambassador Young digging trenches in Austria in 1953, I think it was. And, and there's pictures, and he's writing to his mother. On the back of the picture, notation, he's telling his mother, and, and look, Penmanship for Ambassador Young is very good. I mean, it's, it's very artistic. I'm like, wow, this is really I was in good. love with my fourth grade teacher. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And really, Got it. she's the only teacher that ever really, she put her hands on my shoulder and said, oh, you sure form your letters well. <laughs> you write just like the penmanship book. It was perfect. It was beautiful. And um, I've been writing for that lady ever since. <laughs> and I've even married two fourth grade teachers. <laughs> well, I, I didn't know that. That's funny. Um, so, you know, we, we went through these well, images. Yeah, fourth grade and fifth grade. <laughs> I'm promoting. <laughs> we, we got all the images, uh, the, the letter from President Carter, digitized it. So they had, they had some really rich uh, items in the archive in New Orleans. As a matter of fact, I was driving around New Orleans and I called Ambassador Young. I said, what, what's the street name of your church that you grew up in? And he says, Bienville and Taunty. So I'm driving in the city. We stop, stop take pictures of the actual street and, uh, and all, all of this, all these different things. And so we got back to Atlanta and we did all the archival search in the Auburn Library Research Center, which they had a lot. It was a lot because you're pulling, you probably, I don't know, I didn't do a photo count on no, I didn't. how many they have in that book, but you're going from, a, let's say, 4,500 images to, let's say, you know, maybe 100, 250. And then someone asked, well, well how do you decide? Uh, part of the goal they, was- They picked the ones where I was really good looking. Yeah, well, <laughs> that, was, that was natural because- I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Well, you gotta tell them about, so the reason he has so many great images because he had a relative in New Orleans who had a photo studio. Right. And, and you could tell about Yeah, the, the, first, the first black owned photography store in New Orleans was owned by my aunt. And she wasn't actually my aunt. My, my grandmother had six children, but she raised 11. 
And I don't know how all of that happened, but that's, that was Creole New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And um, one of my aunts uh, started a photography store right on the corner of Rampart and Canal Street. And it's where I had my first job. I mean, I, I, was, I had to get there every morning at, at 7 o'clock and scrub, scrub the floors and dust down everything. And they taught me how to develop pictures. But I, I mean, I, I, I had a background in photography and appreciation of photography. And there was, well, somebody gave me one of these big speed graphics. Mm. In fact, it was the director of the YMCA when I was about 13, 14 years old. And so my hobby in, uh, uh, in high school was uh, photography. I'm so if you, um, I was gonna just go back to when Ernie said I called him and talked to him for two hours, we were working. <laughs> <laughs> I was missing my TV shows. <laughs> um, one of the great photos in this, if you have a copy of the book, is on page 17. Of, um, this is you probably a year old or less than a year old? Yeah. 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 So I think um, we're going to, I have some more questions, but we're going to also have Q&A. So if you have a question, please start lining up um, if you have any questions. But let me ask you this. You have, you know, the name of the book is The Many Lives of Andrew Young. And it seems to me that, you know, you were a top flight athlete growing up. You were, <laughs> I, I have a feeling that if you wanted to do better at Howard, you could have, you would have, but you did very well at seminary. You became a, a noted civil rights figure. You left that, you became a US congressman, then you became a United States UN ambassador, the mayor of Atlanta, now you're a philanthropist um, you, with, your, you, with the Andy Young Foundation. So does everything come easy to you? It must. <laughs> I mean, because I have never known, like I don't have a clue as to what tomorrow will do for me. I mean, I really don't. I, I didn't know, I didn't know I was gonna end up supporting Jimmy Carter until the night I supported, I started. Okay. Because I, I was very cautious. Um, and then, the um, one of these New York newspapers did an attack on him, well, Village Voice. Okay. Village Voice did an attack on him calling him a racist. Mm -hmm. And I was making a speech somewhere in Pennsylvania uh, and um, Jody Powell called me up and said, we need you to kind of do an answer to this and I said, well, um, I don't know how he got it to me, but he read it to me. And I said, that's enough. Mm -hmm. And he said, can we write something for you to send out? I said, no, I want to write it. Okay. And I stayed up the rest of the night. They put the whole page of the Village Voice mm -hmm. was uh, the letter that I wrote and it was really answering the editor of the Village Voice and Julian Barr. Mm -hmm. And um, Julian's problem with Jimmy Carter was, Julian really was a black aristocrat. I mean, his daddy had a PhD. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he'd gone to you know, exclusive prep schools all over. The, and, and, uh, and, and he was very uncomfortable with just the southern twang of Jimmy Carter. Mm -hmm. And so when I got through writing and uh, uh, had it faxed to, to Jody, uh, they put it on the front page of the Village Voice, and that was the week before <laughs> the New York primary. Okay, all right. And, um, but until that night, I was supporting Mo Udall, okay. <laughs> only because I was in Congress with him and all of the congressmen got together and decided that they wanted someone from the House of Representatives as a candidate and I signed on, not really knowing him or thinking about it, but 
once that, you know, hit the front pages, uh, it went statewide. And Jimmy Carter carried New York, so he had no trouble carrying Florida. I see uh, Bill Crane, but I want to ask one follow-up question, Bill. Um, you, I, I wrote Sunday that you are never afraid to talk. You're never afraid to voice your opinion, even when it's not popular. So you talk about when you did not support you, you weren't sure about supporting Jimmy Carter. 30 years later, we had the Barack Obama run for president. You famously said, um, I don't know if it's famous to you, but you said that you want him to be president in eight years, yeah. not in 2008. Um, so you've never been afraid to say what's on your mind, even well, when it's not Well, but there popular. again, um, my mother's godchild okay. uh, was, uh, well, later she married, um, well, Grant Hill's, she's Grant Hill's mother, basketball oh, okay. player. Okay. Say, but she, Calvin Hill, she married Calvin Hill. Calvin Hill, but <coughs> she and Hillary Clinton were roommates at, at Wellesley, is it? No. Well, Wellesley, yeah. Yeah, and um, so I had been hearing about Hillary Clinton since she was in, in, in college. And she, she really, see, they graduated right after Martin's death. Sixty-eight, and um, Ed Brooke was the convention I mean, commencement speaker, mm -hmm. and he gave a speech supporting the war in Vietnam. Uh, you know, two months after Martin Luther King's been killed, and Hillary got up and threw her paper away mm -hmm. and she dressed down <laughs> the only black senator uh, in, in, the, in the Congress and she tore him to bits, yeah. see? And their picture was on the cover, I think, of Look Magazine. Mm -hmm. So I'd been following her since she was 17. Mm -hmm. And, and I had never met Obama. And I made the mistake of reading the wrong book first. See, if you read his book on his childhood and you get who he really is. Dreams of my father. So dreams of my father. But I didn't know that one. The first time I heard of him, paid attention to him, I happened to be in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And his book that he wrote mm -hmm. just came out. And so I read it on the way back from Hawaii. And it wasn't anything that anybody else had was saying. I mean, that was not a good book. Uh. <laughs> See, I mean, it wasn't a good book. I mean, it, 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 it didn't, like, Jimmy Carter's book, uh, Why Not the Best, was so arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> See what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> See, I mean, it really was. Who in the hell is, is this Georgia Cracker saying, Why Not the Best? But you read it and you really say, you know, he is pretty good. Yeah, yeah. See? Well, there was nothing shocking like that about Obama's book. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I didn't pay much attention to it. Mm -hmm. Whereas I had 20 years of experience. I, I mean, Jean, my first wife, and Hillary were were co-chairs of the Children's Defense Fund. Mm -hmm. Hillary had been down in, in Mississippi registering voters, mm -hmm. say, walking the streets of Mississippi, roads of Mississippi. Hillary and her friend hitchhiked to uh, uh, Alaska mm -hmm. and had worked in a salmon factory. Mm -hmm. say, I mean, that's one hell of a woman yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah. See, and... Um, <laughs> I didn't want to make the decision on race. The other thing is, the country was so screwed up. That's what always happens. They wait till something gets really screwed up and then they turn over to somebody black. <laughs> <laughs> See? And I figured that with, with, with uh, you know, her husband with pretty good experience and, and, and he, he would, 
she would have been a great president because she wouldn't have listened to him. Yeah. yeah. See? Mm -hmm. And so everything that I valued uh, pointed to Hillary first and, and then Barack. Okay. All right. And the country might have been better off if it had gone that way, but that wasn't right. Uh, Bill, Bill Crane. Yeah, but I didn't get called on. I've been fine. Ambassador, I've had the pleasure of seeing you speak in any number of roles in your life. But I will never forget your remarks in Centennial Olympic Park just days after the bombing. And you have many skills and talents, and everybody here knows that. But you are always able to calm waters when they are tempest teapot boiling. You are always able to give us that bigger picture. And like you said on the top of King Mountain, just kind of seeing everything a little differently. And we all needed the reset button push that morning. But I watched as you came up to the podium, you pulled out, as you often do, some remarks prepared, prepared for you because it was a very important moment. There were a lot of seats already sold and weren't sure if the volunteers were going to show up. And then you put them back in your pocket. And as you always do, you just ex extemporaneously went on for 30 to 40 minutes. You never, uh, you never, uh, you never stammer. What inspired you that morning? Because I can remember pieces of that speech now from that morning in 1996? Well, I can't, but uh, <laughs> what inspired me was my first church was in Thomasville and Beechton, Georgia. Now, Beechton is halfway between Thomasville and Tallahassee. It's a little crossroads town, and the members of that church were, had come to Georgia from Alabama when the slave master wouldn't let them learn how to read him, wouldn't let their pastor teach them how to read. The pastor came over to Georgia. There was a congregational church school there, and he moved the whole church out of Alabama in the middle of the night and came to Georgia, mm. see, and because of, of the school. But when I got down there as their pastor, they were a Georgia church, and they said, now, preacher, we know you didn't been up north to school and all, but down here, we don't believe in paper in the pulpit. Okay. Yes. And said, if you got something for us, he said, we want it to come from your heart. And said, if it's on paper, we just want you to know, by the third Sunday, there won't be anybody in church. <laughs> See? So I think I was 21 then. And so I started realizing that I had to preach the way these folk wanted me to preach. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's the way it seems to work. Now, well, the, the, it's the church feeding you and not or the spirit, I don't know which, or both. Because as soon as you get up and say, good morning, church, amen, brother, say, uh, make it plain. I mean, the, the, it's a give and take. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Preaching in a country church in Georgia is a conversation. It's not a lecture. And um, I guess... I've done that so much that I wasn't thinking about what I wanted to say. I was thinking about what the people needed to hear. And it works out most of the time. You know, it's noted that um, these are my notes. And uh, <laughs> we were in the green room, and I pulled them out, and I was writing some notes, and he told me to put it away and just talk. So. He said, don't write it down, don't write it down. Yeah, yeah. So yes, you have a question. Hi. First, I am honored to be in your presence from one New Orleans to a fellow New Orleans. I am 45, and you are 90, and you have done some amazing things in and throughout the world. What would be one word of inspiration or encouragement to my generation that is coming up behind you today? Well, I don't think that... Um, well, let me encourage you and you take care of your generation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
when I, when I came down from the mountain in 1951, I ended up in theological seminary that September. Um, and somewhere along the line, somebody gave me a book. It was a little devotional book. And the t title of it was Testament of Devotion by Thomas Kelly. It's a little Quaker book. And there's a, it's really in the first couple of pages that says something like, deep within us all, there's an amazing inner sanctuary of the soul. A quiet place, yet a speaking voice. Eternity is at our hearts, pressing against our time-torn lives. Calling us to an astounding destiny and calling us home to our himself. And you listen to the still small voice within you and go where it's at you and know you'll be all right. So I see, um, I see Tony creeping up, so I want to ask you one, one last question, if that's okay. We can go all night you know, if you want. But um, what's, the, what's the most important thing you've ever done in these 90 years? Well, you know, I've been figuring that out since you all put the book together. <laughs> and I decided that in 1964, uh, Martin Luther King sent me to St. Augustine, Florida. And the Congress was in session, and it was in the middle of the filibuster of the 64 Civil Rights Act. And um, the Klan was so wild and so violent. And, I mean, up, up until that time, there had been more people hurt. Uh, it's the only movement we were in that I've been a part of where the hospital bills were bigger than the bail bond bills. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was really ruthless. And Dr. King sent me down there to stop the movement. Mm -hmm. He said, well, one, he didn't want any more people hurt unnecessarily. He really believed that the Civil Rights Bill would pass within the next two weeks or so. Uh, and he didn't want people hurt for nothing, but he also knew that if for some reason or other the situation got out of hand and it became violent instead of nonviolent, um, that that would kill the Civil Rights Bill. Mm -hmm. So I go down to stop the civil, to stop the march, and I mean my brother. Hosea Williams was also my nemesis <laughs> because he didn't believe. Jose, Jose was in a foxhole in Germany. Well, first place, he, he volunteered for the military when he was 16 or 17 because it was the only place he could go to legally kill white people. <laughs> and, and, and that was his background. So. He was in a foxhole, and there'd been a direct hit, and when they came to get the bodies out, he was the only one alive on the bottom of the bodies. Hmm. And he came back, um, a disabled veteran after 11 months in the hospital, on crutches with a purple heart and in uniform, and drank from a I mean, he didn't even drink from a water fountain. He, he bought a cup mm -hmm. to get water from a fountain that said white only. And some, you know, young thugs roughed him up as a, you know, a veteran with a purple heart mm -hmm. and just coming out of a hospital in the Second World War. Uh, and he decided that God wanted him to be killed 
here for his people. Mm. And he was always trying to get himself killed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, literally, he, 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 he was so fearless, it was, well, Martin Luther King confessed that we all had to be clinically insane. Because nobody in their right mind would think that a ragtag bunch like us could change a nation. Mm -hmm. And he concluded himself. He said, you know, uh, I, I should know better. <laughs> and, uh, but, but anyway, he sent me down there. And when I came by the park and saw the Klan, it was Saturday night, and they were drunk and the breaking bottles and chains rattling and hooping and hollering and going on. And so it was the last place you'd want to march. And I walk in the church and Jose says, there's a, uh, Dr. King has sent Andrew Young down here to lead you all down <laughs> to, to, in the march. And I said, no, Jose, he, did, he said, Andy, you gotta take these people. Blah, 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 blah. So I said, well, I can get them out of the church away from him and then maybe I can be reasonable with them. Mm -hmm and get them to reason. So we got out, we got to the corner, we saw the Klan, we saw the crowd, we heard all the noise, and I got everybody in a circle to pray, um, praying that they'd go back to the church. And then some sister hollers, be not dismayed, things, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. And I said, oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> These folk want to march. <laughs> and my job then became how to let them march without getting anybody killed. And so I kept them on one side of the street and we walked down to where the Klan was and then I said, you all stay here and I went over by myself. Mm -hmm. And I was, I mean, I was, I thought I was making sense and I was having, reaching some of the leaders till somebody came up behind me and um, he hit me with something or other. And, um, but I don't know how long I was. I was kicked and beaten for a good little while, but when I came, Willie Bolden pulled me up and um, I said, we can't go back now. We have to go down to the next corner. Mm -hmm. And going down to the next corner and confronting a, another Klan group, um, this time when they swung at me, I was, I was ready to duck and dodge. And I didn't get hit uh, until there was a great big, I mean, he, I think he's actually six, seven. I've met him since. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, he came in, a policeman. Uh -huh. And see, the Klan was deputized by the sheriff to beat us up. Uh -huh. But the police in St. Augustine really didn't want any Klan violence, so they didn't want us marching. Okay. But this guy stepped in the crowd and said, you all get out of the way. You fool around and kill one of these people, some of these people, and um, none of us want that to happen. And so they let us march on through. Well, that Saturday, they wanted to march in the, Klan wanted to march in the black community. And um, we didn't know what would happen because it was mostly the women and children that were leading the marches, the teenagers. The men didn't march. They said they couldn't be nonviolent. Mm -hmm. And um, I went back home and cussed them out for being cowards. But uh, when the Klan came down through Lincolnville, it was daytime. But they were in their sheets. And we knew they had guns under their sheets. And people started singing, I love everybody. Mm -hmm. I love everybody in my heart. You can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. Mm -hmm. I got the love of Jesus in my heart. That, uh, 
contrast of the violence of the week, two, three weeks before, and the response of people singing a hymn to the Klan, mm -hmm. I think had an impact on the Senate. Mm -hmm. And that Tuesday, they passed the Civil Rights Act. So I, one more so I, I think we, I think I have time for one more question. I want to ask you. Uh, <laughs> I'm a reporter. You know, Hank, my, my. Uh, yes. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Melinda. Okay. Right. So let me ask you this question before we talk about the exhibit. We're gonna talk. We're gonna end on the book because I want to sell the book because my name's on it. Um, <laughs> um, we have a new mayor in Atlanta. Uh, in November, uh, we have a, a national election where the House is in, um, can be flipped, and we're on the brink of World War III. So as a former mayor, as a former congressman, and a former UN ambassador, where, do, where is Atlanta, the country, and the world going? To hell in a handbasket. <laughs> 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 no, seriously. I mean, believe it or not, I was, I was wishing that Jimmy Carter was president. Oh, now? Now. Okay. And the reason was that uh, he and I shared a certain religious insanity, that we believed in the power of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. and believed in miracles. So just like he believed that he could pass the uh, Panama Canal Treaty. He believed he could get Israel and Egypt together. Mm -hmm. Everybody, everybody said this man is insane. This is silly, put them together. Uh -huh. And they've been together, not a single Israeli has killed an Egyptian, what's that, 50 some years now? Mm -hmm. Nor has any Egyptian killed an Israeli. But Jimmy Carter was willing to think outside the proverbial box. I was in, I went to Congress same time Jimmy, um, Joe Biden did. Mm -hmm. If I was as close to Joe Biden as I was to Jimmy Carter, I think Joe Biden has that same kind of humble spirit that Jimmy Carter had. Mm -hmm. Only difference is he's Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, and the spirit moves a little slower. <laughs> 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 Forgive me all my Catholic friends. Uh, but, um, but I think, I mean, I, just the people that are, have called me. I, I was talking to the president of, uh, former president of Nigeria. Um, and I said, you know, you ought to be president now. Because when South Africa had the upper hand and was threatening to destroy Africa, Jimmy Carter and Obasanjo went to church together. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Carter got up and read the Old Testament scripture and said, I first heard of Nigeria when I was doing a car wash down in Plains to send books to a, a, a missionary school in uh, Nigeria. Mm -hmm. When the president of Nigeria gets up to read the New Testament scripture, he says, I want to thank you, Mr. President. I was a barefoot boy that had to walk three, four miles every day to get to that school, but that's where I learned how to read and write. Mm -hmm. But that's also where he became, he ended up somehow, uh, being the number one student in the entire British Empire Commonwealth Engineering School. Hmm. Uh, so he was, he's, he's brilliant, mm -hmm. but he's tough and he's mean. And I mean, he, he's, anytime there's anything wrong in Africa, folks just call him up and send for him. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I was with him in a situation like this. Well, I, I, he invited me to come, and I didn't know it was a trap, 
but it was because we had oil uh, was rising and South Africa was trying to blow up Gulf oil in Angola. And we had to save Gulf oil without getting the U.S. involved. And so I was there in Nigeria and he sent for me. Mm -hmm. And he said, I need you to sit in on a meeting. We're meeting with the president of Angola. And I said, what are we, what are we gonna do? And I said, really the State Department wouldn't want me to accept, sit with him. I'd be breaking protocol. He said, the hell with protocol. Mm -hmm. You are my guests. Mm -hmm. And I want you to sit with me. And well, what we did was we talked him out of, well, we talked him into allowing, it was Gulf oil then, to increase their gas oil production. We would not pay for it. We would put the money in an escrow account so that after the war between Portugal and Angola was over, the money would go to whoever won that settlement. Mm -hmm. And so he got the, pr the, the president of Angola uh, to agree to increase oil production. And that's one of the reasons prices came down mm -hmm. uh, toward the end of the Carter administration. And, was the, and I was thinking to myself, we could do that right now with Venezuela. And we had a young man who ran for president of Venezuela who happened to have a Harvard undergraduate degree and really a, a I mean, a really wonderful guy. Uh, he came close and they put him in jail for eight years. Mm -hmm. But he's still in his 40s. Oh, he's the guy who was here this week. He was here yeah. this week yeah. for a, and, and um, I was talking with him about ways that we could increase the uh, oil production of Venezuela mm -hmm. and let that flow into the market uh, in exchange of letting the dictators have it for two more years and then get away with their lives and all they can steal. Mm -hmm. It's coal, mm -hmm. but it's not bloody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that those are the kinds of things that I think even if, with the worst people, Jimmy Carter could find grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, that's what the world re really needs now. There can be no winners, say, every day. In fact, we were almost a little late because we had a call from somebody from Montgomery, Alabama that got stranded uh, in um, Ukraine and he, he and his wife and baby uh, and they had adopted a three-year-old Ukrainian kid and everybody had a passport but him. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to figure out how they could get him back to Montgomery, Alabama without citizenship. So we were trying to make the rigors of democracy work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we got, a, we got a response from the State Department in about 10 minutes. Mm. Wow. I mean, it was amazing. Uh -huh. See? So I think this is a time when we need a miracle. Okay. We need prayer. And uh, but the song that I like, I don't feel no ways tired. We've come too far from where we started from. And nobody told us that the way would be easy. But I don't believe he brought us this far to leave us. I think that's a great way to close us out. I want to say. Thank you, sir. I just want to say one more thing about the book. For those of you who um, have not bought it, have not purchased it now, uh, it's available now at the Acapella Bookstore still, right? And it's going to be on sale officially on uh, March 29th, so you can order it on uh, Amazon or New South Books, which is the publisher of the book. 
and all your favorite bookstores. So uh, please go out and get it. Uh, if you live here in Atlanta, the Millennium Gate, host, uh, the Millennium Gate Museum has an exhibit, uh, The Many Lives of um, Andrew Young, which is based on the book. Uh, exhibit was put together by Donald Benitez. So uh, please uh, go by and check that out. Pick up the book. Um, and if, you know, one of the things that we wrote about this weekend is that Andy Young has about seven or eight different monuments in the city of Atlanta named after him. So if you're in town, uh, stop by those. It'll be a nice little uh, scavenger hunt to find all the places named after Andrew Young. In the I city. don't know where they are. Including two. <laughs> He has two statues, so that's pretty impressive. Um, so, you want to close out? You want to final words? Yeah, that this. I'm glad you wrote this book because my grandchildren now, uh, well, really, the 10 and 12 year old can read this, and it's not. I mean, they can read it and understand it. Mm -hmm. See? And, um, and it's not too heavy, it's not too complicated, but the pictures show an impossibly blessed life. I don't know why the Lord looked down on me and blessed me so, uh, but uh, My grandmama said to them to whom much has been given, of them will much be required. So I guess that's the reason why I'm still hanging around here because there's something else left for me to do. Well, you're blessed and I'm blessed to have done this book. And you know, the, the nice thing, Ernie mentioned the, uh, the books that we have in the lobby. The nice thing is they are signed as well a uh, wonderful keepsake of this evening. It has been a fabulous evening. And, and you know, I think back to the, the civil rights leaders that we have lost during the, the last couple of years, whether it's John Lewis, C.T. Vivian, Joe Lowry, Hank Aaron, it just goes on and on. It has been wonderful to spend the evening with uh, the remarkable life of Andrew Young. Please join me in thanking Ernie. John and Ambassador Young. Thank you all very much. Can we get a photo? Oh, yeah, that's uh, a good idea.